So uh, you'll hear a very interesting story. The, uh, the lady that began this ministry began it 25 years ago with herself by walking in the uh, streets of Wattis, speaking to the homeless. I'm on. Good. Okay. No. Yeah, I'm on. Speaking to the homeless. And uh, she uh, went and spoke to those that had nothing, spoke to the prostitutes. And because the Lord had laid that ministry on her heart. And uh, she did it for years and years and years by herself. In fact, some of her family members scoffed at her and told her, You're crazy. You're going to get hurt. And uh, over the years, uh, she's convinced her family members that they're crazy because they weren't doing what the Lord wanted them to do. And now they've come alongside her. And some small churches in that area have come alongside her. And uh, now they, they've become incorporated. They're a non-profit corporation. They're uh, trying to... Uh, they didn't really reach out to us. We, I met them alongside a road just this side of El Paso, and gave, was giving them some used clothing to take. And as soon as I met them, the Lord impressed upon my heart that these were special people that need special help. So we'll try to we'll try to see how we can help them. And then, uh, as uh, Mike was saying, Ed's going to start teaching the class on Hebrews, and uh, of course Roger will continue teach his class on Proverbs. So there will be at least two classes every Sunday morning now, and uh, hopefully in the future, not, not, too, not too far distant future, we'll have one other Sunday school class also, although I don't know what that will be. I'm sure the Lord will let us know. So there were two painters who had been painting houses together for a little more than a year, and they were kind of frustrated because they felt the process was going to flow. And one day, the first painter said to the second painter, he said, you know, I've been thinking, and we, uh, we really just haven't accomplished a lot in the last year. It's just going too slow, so I've got an idea. How about we add some water to the paint and thin it up, and that way we'll be able to paint faster. Well, his partner, the second painter, thought about it for a while and agreed uh, to do that. He thought it was a good idea, so they went on for another year until one day the second painter came up to the first painter and said, I want you to know I've been convicted about what we've been doing. And I think we should repaint all the houses that we've painted with the thinned paint. Well, the first painter was, he was aghast, and he exclaimed, All those homes? Are you crazy? Why this sudden conviction? Well, the second painter replied, Last night, I was soundly sleeping in my bed when all the...
in themselves to respond to the things of God. And unless the Holy Spirit intervenes in their life by convicting them of that sin and enabling them then to respond by, uh, to God by faith, they have really no hope of being made alive. That's the, that's the predicament, predicament of the unsaved. And I want us to, to look at and go through this, this teaching here. If you haven't noticed, I want you to understand Paul uses a technique where he shows people state one side of the issue, and then he states the other side of the issue. He states once, and he goes back and forth from the unsaved to the saved, from the unregenerate to the regenerated, from those that don't know the Lord to those that know the Lord. And the, the, the lesson, this, this series of teachings is called Spirit-Led Victory. So there's another angle for us to see beyond what we saw last week. And we'll actually look at both sides, but we're again in our source text is Romans 8, and we'll read the whole section again, starting with the 5th verse through the 11th verse, that's Romans 8, 5 through 11. And if you're ready for the Word of God, would you please signify that by saying Amen? amen. And I, I ask you to do that just because I want you to understand what we're about to do. We're about to, we're about to read the Word of God. And for me, that's very significant. It's not something uh, to slash up on a screen. It's something, to me, that has to be, not only does it have to be rendered by our lips, it needs to be felt by our hearts. And then I always ask you to stand, would you please stand, for the victorious reading of God's Word. And I, I ask you to do that just out of the symbol of respect for God's Word. Just once every service so that we can, we can draw and be ready to listen to what God has to say to us. Romans 8, 5 follows. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal, carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body. Through His Spirit, who dwells in you. Thank you. You can be seen. So, what we have, as we pick up today, we pick up today in the sixth verse, with the phrase, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And again, as we noted last week, Paul speaks here in the form of an equation, not in the form of a consequence. What Paul is saying, he says, to be spiritually minded, to dwell on the things of God, equals, equates to life and peace. Okay? And we could, add, we could add another equal or equate to sign there. To be spiritually minded equals life and peace equals being a real Christian. A true Christian. To be spiritually minded is synonymous to being a Christian. A person who is born again, given spiritual life by Christ, by God's grace, is a spiritually minded person. Additionally, we can say that to be spiritually minded is also synonymous with, as Paul writes, life and peace. This is a peace with God. And there is no greater peace than having peace with God. See, the unsaved, no matter how they might claim to honor God, no matter how they might attempt to worship God and love God, never experience that peace. We, who are children of God, have peace and life with our Father. And so if this is if, if this equation here that Paul puts before us is in fact correct, it is impossible 
to have a mind that has life and peace if it remains dead to the things of God. You understand what I'm saying? You can't, you can't have a life of peace, a life of a life that is uh, at peace with God unless you know God. And then, so to take it to the extreme, which I'm bound to do, if you take it to the next step, when we, we can say that a professing Christian that has no sensitivity to the things of God, no, remember last week we used the phrase, holy affections, they don't belong to God. They may profess, but if they don't have holy affections, if they don't have sensitivity to God's will in their life, then there is, there is a disconnect somewhere. Now an unbeliever may be deeply concerned about living by religious standards. Happens all the time. They may be concerned about living their life to certain codes that they have set up for themselves. Or maybe the codes and standards of their denomination. Or another religious organization. You know, when I was a school superintendent, I belonged to the Kiwanis. Now, I went to my Kiwanis meeting once a month, and we, we said the pledge to the flag, and we did good works, moral works. And that's not to say anything bad about the Kiwanis. But for some that were at that Kiwanis meeting, when you spoke to them of God, they had no interest in the thing of, things of God. They had interest in living their life to a moral code which they had developed for themselves. Not one that God had developed for them. So let's realize that when uh, people set these standards for themselves, they may set these codes for themselves, and in fact they may even struggle to meet the standards and codes that they set for themselves. That is purely on a human level. It is a struggle that is not generated by a love of God. It is a struggle that is generated by self-love. People oftentimes try to figure out what can I do to gain favor with God. And if that's your motivation, don't do nothing. Because it won't be worth nothing to God. When he looks upon it, he will not see it as being one of his works. It will be your works. Uh, people oftentimes want to have other people see them in a certain light, and that becomes their motivation. That's the wrong motivation. Whatever religious and moral struggles that these people may have, their problems are problems of flesh with flesh. Not spirit against flesh. And flesh with flesh is a real problem in the church. The Holy Spirit, see, is not in a fleshy person. And a fleshy person is not in the Holy Spirit. And because that is, in fact, the reality, that is, in fact, the truth, Many, many people struggle with a Christian walk which has been engineered in their own minds and in their own hearts. Paul has illustrated now in the seventh chapter of Romans that a true Christian does in fact battle with the flesh. But that battle is because their mortal body still hangs on and tries to lure them back into their own sinful ways to degrade their witness. Speaking of true believers, Paul said in Galatians 5, 17, he says, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. It's important to note that whenever Paul speaks of the idea of sin in the life of a believer, he always speaks it in regards to it being the outer corrupted body, not the new inner nature. Listen, a, a, a believer's flesh isn't redeemed. Our flesh isn't redeemed when we trust in Christ. If that were so, if our flesh had been redeemed, all Christians would immediately become perfect. And uh, we know that's not the truth. The scripture tells us that's not true. And if you really want to know, all 
Sometimes the writer, <coughs> majority of the time Paul is one that uses this technique, will speak to salvation <coughs> in a future tense. Later on in Romans in 13, 11, he says, And do this knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. That salvation isn't the ultimate of salvation. And again, in this chapter, later on in the 23rd verse, we're going to read the words, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body, which speaks to our perfection, as perfected as a human being can be. Paul was explaining this to the Corinthians, I think, in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 44, when he said, The body is sown in corruption, it is raised in <coughs> corruption. The body is sown in corruption. That's how the body begins. It is raised in incorruption. He goes on. It is sown, he says, in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown, he says, in weakness. But it is raised, he says, in power. It was sown, we were sown, a natural body. But it's raised, it's raised up, he says, a spiritual body. Then he uses this. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. So no matter how self-sacrificing, how moral and how sincere the life of an unredeemed person may be, their religious efforts are in fact, according to the word of God, selfish because they cannot truly serve God. Paul goes on, he says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. And Paul uses the phrase again, remember we looked at last week, Thrown am I here when he speaks of mind, and remember that refer, refers to the content of the thought, the thought patterns, the basic inclination and orientation of a person, the way they function. So he says, because the carnal mind, the thought process, the content, the inclination of this person is basically enmity against God, which is nothing more to say than hostile. An enemy of, one who does not, in no ways desires to be part of that entity. And let's recognize here the, the truth of this statement. Having a carnal mind is much, much worse than any act of disobedience that the carnal minded might perpetrate. Do you understand me? I'm saying that the carnal mind is much worse than the actual act of disobedience that the carnally minded might perpetrate because the action is merely the outward manifestation of the inner fleshly compulsions of the unregenerate person. Why do people go out and kill people? Because they've chosen to. Somebody gave me something last week to read. It's a, it was a it was in um, before one of our congressional committees. It's hard to tell which one because we have so many. And it was it was uh, the words of a father who lost a I believe a daughter at Columbine. And. Uh, his name was Scott. I remember the last name was Scott, I believe. And he spoke, as he spoke to these congressmen, he said, uh, he made an equation. I should have brought it up here with me. I would, that way I could look at it. But he made an equation uh, because all of them were crying out for, at, after Columbine, it was as it is now. Maybe not quite as much. It is as it is now. Reform this, do that. Reform this, do that. And, you know, the NRA and people like that were immediately, the conservative right were immediately the bad guys. And he, uh, he asked these congressmen, he said, uh, when Cain uh, killed his brother Abel with a club, did the, did the uh, higher 
time uh, cry out for club, uh, new club rules. Do we need new club rules? Because Cain took a club and killed his brother. People do evil things because they have an inclination, they have a pronoma, they have an inward drive to do evil things. That's why they do it. If it is not, if it's not a gun, it will be something else. So we, and then this father went on to say, how, how, in essence, his words were, how dare you accuse anyone else of any of these problems when you yourself, the leaders of our country, have kicked prayer out of our school. But he went on to say that I want you to understand one thing. That the day that those children were being murdered in the library at Columbine, there were a lot of prayers in the school that day. But then we turn around. When will we learn, as a nation, as a people, when will we learn what's truly important? How many massacres will it take before the people of God will get up and take back her country. Because that's the only thing that will change it. We've got little people running around the church. They need our help. They don't need, they don't need words. They don't need more laws. They need heart changes. And only, the only thing that will change those hearts is God's people. Finally, getting back to God. See, when you have unredeemed people, whether they be religious, and there are, whether they be atheistic, and there are, whether they be outwardly, or uh, they may be moral, more very moralistic outwardly, they may be very wicked outwardly, but whenever you have unredeemed people, they are in enmity to God. There can be no other way. Ed was speaking this morning about things that God hates. And you know, there's, there's, there's a lot to be said about what God loves. But these are people, listen to Paul's words continuing in the text. It says, these are people, their spiritual condition is, they are not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. It is not within them to understand the law of God. They're not capable of good. Why would you expect them to do good? Since their motivation has to be... Why do people kill a bunch of kids like that? These people are driven by themselves. They have a desire for no notoriety. They have a desire to make a name for themselves. But see, that's not the way that God works. Our actions have to be actions that glorify Him. Paul says in verse 8, Those who are in the flesh, he said, cannot please God. That's a very important two-word phrase. Please God. That, you want to write, write, here's a little, here's a little thesis paper for you. The purpose of all mankind. Please, God. That's what the Word tells us in the 12th chapter of this epistle, what many prefer to call the practical section of Romans. To me, it's all practical. But in the first two verses of the 12th chapter, Paul writes, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. My brothers in the Lord, present yourselves today acceptable to God. If you've got anything in your life today that's not acceptable to God, get it out. Okay? And he continues, he continues with a phrase, which is your reasonable service. Don't feel like you're doing anything great when you do it. It's what, it's what you should be doing daily anyways. And then he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and perfect will of God. 
kind of says what it says up here. It's our church verse, and we want to try to live that way. These words are very similar to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 9. He said, therefore, we make it our aim. This is our goal. This is what we're shooting at, the implication in the Greek, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him. To be well-pleasing to Him. And to the Thessalonian believers in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1, he said, finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk, and to please God. So after describing these spiritual characteristics and incapacities of those who are in the flesh, Paul again, in our text, switches back, and he addresses the other perspective, the other side of the coin, in verse 9, those who are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, he wrote, those who are, he writes, those who are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, this is a, when he says in the spirit, this is the same thing that Jesus alluded to when he spoke to the, the man of great knowledge, Nicodemus, in John 3, 6, he said, that which is born of, of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Can we go other way? Sinful human flesh is only capable of reproducing more sinful human flesh. It is only by God's intervening Holy Spirit that spiritual life can in fact be produced. So what, what, what Paul says here, he says, uh, he's speaking, are not in the flesh but in the spirit. And he gives you kind of a little test here. This is a test you want to know this morning. You want to self-administer a test. Question number one. This is, a, that, it is, it is the, this is question number one on the test. There's only one question so it shouldn't be hard to finish. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit is in fact an evidence of self-saving faith in the life of a believer because Paul is saying, it's as if Paul is saying here, you can be certain of your salvation if, if, and then he writes, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Is the Spirit of God dwelling in you? That's a very, again, significant phrase. That word dwell in the Greek is oikei, oikei, and the word means, it means, it's the idea of one who is in their own home. So look at the way it reads, if indeed the Spirit of God is in home in you. There's the Spirit of God in home in you. In other words, there's the Spirit of God comfortable? Is the Spirit of God resting? Is the Spirit of God acting? Is the Spirit of God dwelling in home in you? So the implication is that the Spirit of God in a marvelous way, and I'll, I'll say for me, incomprehensible way makes His home in our life. And in the life of everyone who believes in Jesus Christ. Everyone. But again, Paul uses that phrase and then he, again he feels, why is, this, why is this back and forth? Why is this back and forth? Back and forth, back and forth, over and over and over. Because now he just has spoken about the Spirit of God dwelling in us and then he gives the opposite picture again. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he says, he is not is. We can't be Jesus if we don't have the Spirit of Christ. Those that display no evidence of the presence of the power, no fruit of God's Spirit, one fruit in their lives, have no legitimate claim to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Those that display no desire for the things of God or the desires of the desires that they desire, I want to pick and choose how I want to function in the Lord. Those that have those desires, it would seem to indicate, are not indwelt. To, to, they aren't indwelt by the Spirit. They have, you, you know, you don't get to pick and choose. Sin avoidance is supposed to function 
function at a 100% accuracy. In other words, you should avoid all sin. That's what Paul would entreat you to do. Sin avoidance, if you really want to know the truth, is supposed to, in fact, be successful 100% of the time. Will you be? No. Should you be trying? Yes. And that's why I don't understand when we get burdened and burdened and burdened repetitively by the same thing over and over and over. Why can't we get victory? Victory. Victory, it says, is ours. But we struggle because we don't want to give things away. We don't want to give away a piece of our, our, our old nature. We have allowed that lust, that piece of lust, to hang on to us. Let's get rid of those things. That's why Paul tells us to test ourselves. He uses that word in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves, test yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. And then test yourselves. And he asks a question. Do you not know yourselves that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. Those are words that were spoken to <coughs> believers. Test yourself, believers. <coughs> Test yourself. Paul continues in verse 10 of our text this morning. If Christ is in you, he says, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Righteousness. In other words, he says that if God's spirit dwells within you, then your own spirit is alive because of righteousness. That is because of the divinely imparted righteousness by which every believer is in fact justified. Remember when we studied back in the third chapter, which seems like a long time ago because it was, but in 3.21 through 26 we studied, but now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all, all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short, fallen short, of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God sent forth as a propitiation by His blood, through faith, to demonstrate His righteousness. Because in His forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness. Get the idea? That He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. See, in light of that perfect righteousness, Whenever we attempt in ourselves to be righteousness, what is, what is it? Philippians 3 8, what does it say it is? Rubbish? Is that right? <coughs> well, yeah, there's some other words for that word. Any attempt, be we lost or be we saved, when we attempt to do things within ourselves to be righteous, it doesn't work. It's not any good. So now Paul will sum up verses 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 by what he says in verse 11. And what he says in verse 11 is, is simply this. But the spirit of him, uh, that's a big age, who raised Jesus from the dead, well, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, God raised Jesus from the dead via the spirit, who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Let me read that again. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, has a house inside of you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. 
Spirit. Remember we said in the first seven chapters, the spirit, word Spirit is mentioned one time in the book of Romans. Now it's mentioned all over the place, one chapter almost 20 times. And what it says here is that the Holy Spirit was the divine agent in Christ's resurrection. He lifted Christ out of physical death and gave him life in his mortal body. And so now the Spirit, who has dwelled within us, who has come home into the heart, into the life of the believer, gives us a new life now. Both in these flaws, bodies, and eventually, forever, in our perfected human bodies. We were talking about that this morning. Getting old is a drag. But you know what? It won't be one day. There will be no problem with this old body when I go and meet my Savior. How fortunate how fortunate we are to be God's people. And you know, I was struck this morning when I was going over my notes. I, I used to go over my notes Sunday morning as I listen to music. And I'm just struck how much God wants us. God just wants us. And listen to me, folks. He wants, he wants, because in a crowd like this today, there are here, those people here that don't know Jesus. The word, is in, the word is full of that teaching. That there will be many in church. When it says there will be many that will come before me that he, that he doesn't know. And he's talking about Christian people that are going to come. And he's going to say, get away from me. I don't know who you are. Well, we did this and we did that and we did that. We proclaimed and we did this and cast out that. And I don't even know. So in church this morning, in a place like this, there's people here that have been playing at being Christians. And there's Christians here that need to get right with the Lord. So why not now? If that's what God wants, and maybe I'm wrong, why not now? You want to wait another week? You want to wait another month? How about six months? What about a year? Because the longer you wait, the harder it gets. That's another thing. Because our hearts get hard. Even for a Christian. See, spiritual bondage in the life of a Christian has to do one thing. It, 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 it either has to be weakened by your drawing closer to God. Because the closer you get to God, the further away that bondage has to run. Or it gets stronger. Yes.
And Lord, we, uh, we come before you and we, uh, I lay my sins at your feet, Lord. Forgive me for the thoughts I've had, the feelings I've had, Lord. Forgive me for the impressions in my life, Lord. Help me to grow stronger in and by you. And Father, I just lift up each and every one here today. I pray, Lord, if there is one here that knows you not, that this would be the day that they would come to saving salvation. But I also recognize the fact, Lord, that that's between you and them. So, Father, I just uh, ask that you work in their hearts, work in their minds, work your will in their lives. But we know there is an element of free will, Lord. So it's based, it's based, it's got to be partially our decision, Lord. And then uh, you will draw them near those that you desire. So, Lord, Lord whatever the circumstance, whatever the problem might be, uh, we just give this time to you time of reflection as we sing a song and ask you, Lord, to cleanse our hearts, to cleanse our minds, to cleanse our souls, Father, and help us to be all you want us to be, both as individuals and as a body of believers. We thank you again for this opportunity to be in your house. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Please stand and join us in our closing song.
tribute to you as we come before you today, Lord, and lift her up in prayer. We pray, Lord, that you would grant the prayers of your people. We have a right, Lord. You, you, you're, uh, you, you, you teach us, Father, that you will listen to the prayers of your people. <coughs> the Lord, uh, maybe a right is too strong a word to utter. But, Father, we, we know you desire to be glorified. We know that you desire that you look upon us and, and be pleased by our actions. So we come together and draw together today as one body and ask that you heal our sister. Be with her in a special way. And Lord, we will give you the glory. We will give you the honor. And Father, we will give you the praise that is rightfully yours. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Somebody to say, no, nah, don't do it that way, do it this way. I think we're, we're close. Well, I've been beat upon enough by good sound people to know a few things. There you go. <laughs> can't say that I know it all. All right, it, it would be, I'll get hold of you, but uh, Renee and I, I'd, I'd be wonderful. I appreciate it. Yeah, have you been to the new little, rest, new little Mexican restaurant yet? Yeah. Best shopping town. Yeah. That's the only restaurant. Yes. 